I'm Brian Bonner. I've lived in Ukraine on and off for 26 years, continuously the last 14 years until the start of the war on February 24th. I, for all this time, most of this time, I've been the chief editor and the CEO of the Kiev Post Ukraine's primary English language newspaper. I want to impart a sense of urgency. All the experts are saying Ukraine has just three weeks to get the jets, the missiles, the ammunition, all the weapons they need to prevail. And there's the urgency and the almost desperation is very real. Everybody knows that the coming battle is in the southeast part of Ukraine, from Kharkiv in the northeast, all the way down through the Donbass to Odessa on the south central, the Black Sea port. If Ukraine gets these weapons, it can defeat this nation, this people can defeat Putin. It will be a huge victory for democracy, for Ukraine for years and decades to come to defeat Putinism. But the US, NATO, the West has to stop pussyfooting around. They need to get the weapons in here. Now, stop making excuses for why you can't give jets, missiles, and other ammunition to Ukraine, please. The U.S. and NATO are talking big, saying Ukraine can't lose, Ukraine must win, Russia must lose, but they're not acting like it. And today we got more evidence of that. Uh, NATO Secretary Jens Stoltenberg again said no MiG jet fighters, no other jet fighters to Ukraine. Ukraine has been asking for them for a long, long, long time. And long range missiles, S-300 missiles, there's even a website now listing the heavy artillery, light artillery, jets. Uh, missiles, other equipment that Ukraine needs now in abundance. Why now? Because NATO intelligence and U.S. intelligence say that the coming battle is going to be decisive. The U.S. also is keeps talking about we are doing unprecedented amounts of assistance, unprecedented amounts of uh, sanctions. Not enough. Not enough, guys. So on the one hand, we need the weapons and we need them now because Russia still has air superiority. If Ukraine could control the skies, and they'll do it themselves with their pilots, NATO's equipment, but they'll do it themselves, we wouldn't have the Mariupols, we wouldn't have Arka being bombed into submission, Chernigiv, on and on and on. So there's the weapons component. The sanctions component, again, is another big talk and not enough action. The biggest sanction that needs to be done is oil, gas, and coal. And they're taking baby steps to that. The world buys almost a billion dollars a day in Russian oil, gas, and coal. And now, only now, the EU is gonna phase out coal purchases and work towards blocking Russian ships and ports, which would dampen oil purchases. But Germany, Austria, many others are, are coming up with one excuse after another why they can't do this. They would rather genocide happens against the Ukrainian people than to suffer a recession. This is immoral. We are now in the, the moral test of the 21st century. I believe what's happening now is not just war, it's not just war crimes, it's not just atrocities, it is genocide. Uh, Ukrainians are being killed just for being Ukrainian. We see this in liberated city after city. And imagine what, is, what, what the horrors uh, await us in other cities that are now under Russian control, where Russians have been in control, and that will be liberated, hopefully, very soon by Ukrainians. And besides what the soldiers are doing, nothing to do with military. It's all about this orgy of killing. And they seem to be excited by this. This seems to be thrilling them to kill Ukrainians because intercepted phone calls back to their home show that they're happy to kill Ukrainians. They're under orders to shoot, shoot anybody they see from people to animals. And all it takes is one trip to the Russian TV dial to see that they are promoting the idea that we need to bomb the hell out of Kiev, bomb the hell out of Lviv, destroy the Ukrainian nation. Nothing happens on state TV without, without Putin trying to set the public mood. So yes, this is definitely genocide. Putin has gone off the rails. He is the 21st century successor to Hitler and Stalin. He does not look like he's going to back down. 
Ukraine has been a problem for him all the time because Ukrainians have the temerity in his, his book to defy him, to embrace their statehood, their culture, their language, their people, and a different way of life, a democratic way of life, and one that's part of the European family and one that has security guarantees for their future. And Putin is, because he can't create any system but a dictatorship, uh, where people live in fear of him in Russia. He doesn't want anybody around him to succeed. He will keep going until he's, he's stopped. Ukrainians are on the verge of delivering him a sound military defeat. If he does that, if he is defeated, then we have the, have the chance to roll back the tide, not just for Ukraine, but for democracy around the world. Democracy will advance again will put an end to the autocrats like Putin. He, you know, we can't live in fear. He's not the only one with nuclear weapons, and I don't believe he's suicidal. So we cannot live in fear of this nuclear card, this nuclear threat from this midget dictator, this midget madman. We have to, we, we have to use our collective strength as the West and help Ukraine to, to win this fight anyway. If he's, be, you know, U.S. and Russia have clashed militarily in Syria. There was no nuclear war. Turkey and Russia have clashed militarily in Turkey. There was no nuclear war. I still believe there's a rationality, uh, but I, I, I think that given the fact that uh, the West has been signaling what they won't do and that they're squeamish about, you know, losing some uh, GDP and having their economies in recession, I think he, this, this just makes them all the more emboldened. So he's got to lose. I believe that Ukrainians, after some shaky early days are starting to turn the war around in their favor. Why? Because they're extremely motivated. They're fighting for survival. Bucha massacre shows you what happens if Russia takes over Ukraine. It's going to be, it's going to be more genocide. So Ukrainians are fighting for their lives with the urgency of their lives. They're much stronger on the ground. They have the entire civilian support. They have their, they're fighting on their home field advantage, but they don't have the uh, air superiority, the numbers, or you know the the advanced missile systems that that russia has so russia is slowly slowly bleeding bombing destroying this oil depot this ammunition storage place this civilian target and uh you know this can be stopped easily by again bringing the weapons uh to ukraine now this war as you know has 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 sent more than 10% of Ukrainians, 4 million people abroad, most of those refugees to Poland. First of all, people there are happy to be alive uh, and, and Poland is making them feel welcome with events, flags, greetings, help uh, to get food, apartments, places to stay, education. They're, they're really doing it because Poles understand it. They were stuck between Hitler and Stalin also during World War II. So, that is good, but everybody, nobody expects to be a refugee. And one thing about refugees I know is we always expect that we're gonna go back to our home when maybe our home is not gonna be waiting for us and maybe it's gonna be obliterated in, in Ukraine. Uh, so there's shock, there's guilt at people left behind. Men are not allowed to leave uh, Ukraine. They're not allowed to leave Ukraine and, and they have to stay for the fight. Now, what's really, uh, you know, there's so many upended lives, you know, Human life is the most precious. Property is later. But, you know, people work all their lives for their apartments, for their savings, for their jobs and everything. And a lot of the, this is being lost. There's a category of Ukrainians who want to get home as soon as they can. And that's starting to happen. When the Battle of Kiev was won, this Battle of Kiev was won, people are, are starting to trickle back. Uh, people are coming back. They're talking about coming back. Uh, other there's another category of, of Ukrainians who will never come back because mainly because they live, Ukraine is too close to Russia and they don't want to put up with this again. Um, and then there's another category who are looking at, you know, uh, you know, where they can, where they can, how they can replant their lives in, in, in whatever country they are. Now that's the refugees who left another half, five, six million are, are in different parts of Ukraine. Now, Western Ukraine is seen as safe, but as we know, Lutsk has been bombed. That's in the far west of Ukraine. 
and uh, Lviv has been bombed right up on the Polish border. So there's really no safe place. You know, I've lived in Ukraine for many years, yeah, mostly as the editor in chief of the Kiev Post, CEO of the Kiev Post, until our untimely demise in November. Uh, and I have family here. Uh, dearest to me is my 16 year old daughter. She was in Kharkiv with my ex wife and a, a, a number of their relatives, and they were bombed day and night, day and night. I feel the guilt for not having been able to protect her. Now I can safely say, or say that uh, with, with relief that she is safe now. Everybody in the family is safe. Uh, of all my friends and family, uh, nobody, or colleagues, or ex-colleagues, nobody has been killed, thank God. Uh, some have lost their homes, and, and many are scattered to the winds. They're not where, they're not in their homes. Now, if you want to single out, uh, there's many people to single out or nations for not supporting Ukraine, China, India, Pakistan, but from the West, from a country, a country that in the European Union that positions itself as a world global economic democratic leader, Germany is by far the most disappointing. They took themselves down this road of becoming so energy dependent on Russia's gas that they've stunted their, their economy and, and held their economy hostage and held their foreign policy hostage to the Kremlin. Very bad position to be in. The one person that should be sanctioned straight up is Gerhard Schroeder, who, who did this. And let's, let's keep in mind, Nord Stream 2 came into being a year after Putin took uh, Crimea and started the uh, war in Eastern Donbass. That sent the signal. He can do this, he can invade his neighbors, he can do whatever he wants. The decadent West will take his money. And in that calculation, he was partly right. Germany also has been denying Ukraine's greater uh, ambitions for uh, integration in the European Union and in NATO, while at the same time creating simulators for soldiers training of Russian soldiers on Russian soil and selling Russia dual use technology, uh, which can be used for military purposes. It's not good behavior. And Germany is now, uh, as I understand it, dragging its feet on uh, and, and is probably going to block an EU ban on oil and gas uh, sales from Russia. The one thing that uh, that Germany is doing well is is taking in refugees. I believe more than three hundred thousand, treating them well. But you know, there's something very very wrong in the way this the world is reacting. We're talking about benefit concerts for refugees, helping refugees. Uh, all that is great, but there will be no refugee problem. And and they're talking about reconstructing Ukraine. Well, that's premature. I mean, first of all. You got to get the war over, stop the destruction so that the cost doesn't keep going up. We've seen estimates of a half a trillion to a trillion dollars in, in, in damage, in, in property damage alone. So first of all, you got to, if you want to help Ukraine, get, the, get them what they need to stop the war and win the war. Secondly, uh, it's great to help refugees, but these refugees don't want to be refugees. If they win the war, they'll come home and they'll, they'll take care of themselves. So. These are the things that I think uh, the world is get, the free world is getting out of order. Win the war, we'll take care of the rest after that.